Well, take your Bibles and turn to the book of Acts. We have a lot to cover today, and it's a long, long sermon. We should be out by 315. Um, listen, isn't it amazing when you get into God's Word? If something you're really interested in that you want to know, what has to happen is you'll, just get dig, you'll dig deeper and deeper and deeper. And that's the hard part about teachers. If you have a Sunday school teacher who goes long, <clears throat> right? I can look around. <clears throat> I can look around the room. It's most of our teachers because why do they take so long? It's because there's so much. How do you take this much information and how good God is and squeeze it right down to a time frame that we can actually, that our behinds and our minds can take, right? If you, if you go longer than either one of those can take, it will take, uh, you can lose interest. So take the book of Acts, chapter 2, very positive, very powerful message from the Apostle Peter today as we read and then uh, as we even understand that we think Luke is writing this, his second uh, chapter, and it's, it's a powerful message. If you're here today and you're a Christian, this is a powerful message, hopefully to influence you to be bold in your faith for the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're here today and you're not a Christian, it should, it should be challenging to you that actually convicts you to the core, just as these people we're going to read about, convicts you, do you know that you know that you know that you're saved? And if you find your place in either way or in between somewhere there on that journey, listen, this is the spiritual journey that we're on. We're actually looking for the truth found in the Word of God. Today's sermon title is simply this, Truth Will Set You Free. Who, who did I quote for that? That's Jesus Christ. Well, let's get in and see today, today's message. We have to back up just a little bit. If, if you were not here last week, we, we preached about the coming of the Holy Spirit. Jesus told his disciples before he ascended back to heaven, hey, you go to Jerusalem and you wait. And there was a special day they were waiting on. It was a festival for all the Jews, um, a festival of weeks or, or, or a feast of weeks. We call it Pentecost, and they were waiting there in Jerusalem. People were traveling from Rome and Egypt and uh, all over the countryside to come to this festival. Why? Why did they have to come back to Jerusalem? If there were devout Jews, why did they have to come back? We kind of do it in the Baptist circles. We call it homecoming. We're not mandated to do it, but we do it and go back home. It's good to see everybody, but this was the law of God. Why did they have to come back to Jerusalem? Why not where they are in Rome and why not in Egypt and why not in different places that God has sent their families? Why can't they just worship there? Because the temple's there in Jerusalem. They have to come back to the temple and they have to worship together. So everybody from all over, devout Jews would come back to Jerusalem and this is Pentecost. By the way, there was one Pentecost for us. It never happened again. Never need for the Holy Spirit to come again. We're going to actually see how he worked. And the Holy Spirit is he, by the way, not it. Make sure when you talk about the Holy Spirit, you talk about him properly, because he is part of the Godhead. Let's read together back to verse 11. Cretans and Arabs, it's just a list. We're ending up in the back of the list. What did they hear when these people spoke in King James, New King James says tongues? It says, we're speaking in our own tongues or languages, the wonderful works of God. What were these apostles preaching? We talked about this morning in Sunday school. What were they preaching? You have to go back to the wonderful works of God. If they're talking to a Jewish audience, they have to reach back into the Jewish history. What do they have to preach? Some of them were probably singing, Father Abraham had many sons, right? I'm not sure they were singing that song, but they would teach about the things of Abraham. They would teach about the exodus out of Egypt, saying, God is so good. God is great. They would sing all the different things about the times and preach the things about what God has done for the Jewish people, for the nation. But also those who are there that are Gentiles would hear and say, wait a minute, these things... Uh, I've heard about these stories, and, and we know these stories. And we go to verse 12. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? So I want you to see the, the amazing thing is that these apostles and disciples spoke in other languages. They spoke in other dialects. They actually spoke in a language that was not common to them. They didn't know the language. It was something the Holy Spirit had come upon them and had given them this language. They're speaking something, even them themselves, I had not studied for, it was something that Jesus told them to wait for. So the Holy Spirit comes upon them, and he, they start speaking to all these people of different languages. Is that even possible when you think about things? As a kid, I used to hear that story and think about that. Is that possible, you think? Could God do that? In one moment, could God change it where all the languages are understood? Well, in the Old Testament, did God in one moment change the languages where they could not be understood? It was the Tower of what? Babel or Babel, how you pronounce it. So God divided the languages for once upon a time to actually make it happen. And now he's brought them back together, the people together. And he's brought a common language back in, powered and fueled by, if you had a sticker that says your advertisement, the Holy Spirit. 
He's come in on the day of Pentecost. He's brought about the word so these people can understand in their own language, in their own dialect, what God's word says. They were speaking about the greatness of God. Well, in every case, we have these people who are here. These people come to Town Creek Baptist Church. I don't know if you know that. Uh, some of these people in verse 13 come to Town Creek as well. Verse 13, others, mocking said, they are full of new wine. They've come to the place and they just blew this off saying, we don't believe this. Is that happening in our culture today? When you preach Jesus and people say, actually, listen, there's other ways to heaven. I used to say this, and I was, I was always a young conservative young man trying to study the Bible, and I'd hear people say, well, there's multiple ways to God. Everyone ends up with God. And I was like, no, no, there's only but one way. But I started thinking as I processed through this, not from a liberal standpoint, but from a very conservative biblical standpoint, everyone that's ever been born will make their way to God. Let me tell you how, before you start throwing tomatoes and lettuce at me. If you're a born-again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you understand that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That means you have an avenue directly to the Father, where the Father is, is where Jesus is, and where Jesus is, is where Christians are going to be. Is that true? So we're going to be in his presence because of the Lord Jesus Christ. What about all the other folks in the whole world, every other religion that says, there's other ways, Jesus is not the only way, or I don't believe there's a God at all. Will they face God? The answer is... Yes, there's two judgments. The judgment seat of Christ for those that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's the, the great white throne judgment for those who are unbelievers. Those who say, I don't believe that Jesus is the only way. Every person will stand before God, either as their Savior and Redeemer, right? Jesus Christ will be your advocate, standing beside the throne of God saying, mine, mine, mine. I died for that one, I died for that one, and I'm going to be there. I died for that one. But there's others of you going to go say, but Lord, look at Matthew 7. I told you the scariest chapter, the scariest verses in, in all of the Bible to me is Matthew chapter 7 for some people that I love. They said, but Lord, didn't we do all these things in your name? And he says, depart from me. I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. They even list things in Matthew 7 that they did that I've never done. Go back to Matthew 7 on your own time. We don't have time today and read it. It's amazing when you start being confronted by the truths of the word of God going, is it possible for someone to sit in a Southern Baptist church their entire life, sing in the choir, be a deacon, be a trustee, whatever name, be a preacher, and miss heaven? Could they have the same Bible that we have and read it for a text without understanding the author and finisher of our faith? Is it possible for you to sit and listen to preaching? And I know I'm not the best preacher. I've already admitted to that. I understand that. But is it possible to take the Word of God and read it for ourselves and actually miss it? Yeah, because you intellectually look at this and say, well, it doesn't make sense. Listen, anytime you deal with God, he never makes sense on the human level because he's not just a human. He's infinite God. Is that true? Well, let's keep going. So there's people who are there. They're amazed and perplexed. These are devout Jews who have traveled long distances there. They've come because they want to worship God. They're seeking after God. And here's the disciples waiting because Jesus said to wait. And yet there's those people who are mocking sin. They're, they're drunk. They're full of new wine. Verse 14 is where we'll pick up today. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. Now he probably was preaching Aramaic. I don't know, but they would have understood a common language of the, of the day. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he goes and tells a prophecy. Now you go through verse 17, 18, and when you get to verse 19, something transitions. Is it possible to have a prophecy that is partially fulfilled now and partially fulfilled later? The answer is yes, and we have such scripture right here in front of us. Even in the day of when God speaks about one word back in times past, could it actually have a meaning for something in the future? That is the word of prophecy, right? Because the prophets wrote down the words, sometimes they're alphabetical right there on the spot, but this one is forward-looking. Joel, when he wrote this, he's forward-looking. He's looking down through history because he's inspired by the Holy Spirit to write this. And he says this, And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your younger men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and my maid servants, I will pour out my Spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and the signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. 
The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's a mouthful, isn't it? That's a thoughtful. We can sit around and have coffee and talk about this for a long time. Last days are the end times. Think of lowercase. Are we living in end times now? Lowercase end times. The end of time when Jesus came, he started what? He had to fulfill the prophecies of the Messiahship. They had to fulfill the prophecies that one was coming to take away our sins. And so from the time of Jesus' coming until the time of his death, burial, and resurrection, as soon as the resurrection took place, what happens? The end times are in play. Small, lowercase e. Now the proper end times, capitalize e, if you think about this, it's a time that everything's going to stop. If Jesus comes back today before we get to the Lord's Supper, right? We're going to do this in his name. Do this in his name until he returns. If he returns, there's still going to be tomorrow. There's seven years of tribulation that's got to happen even if he comes back today. So there's no way today, the world's going to end today, just for the record. If you're ever a doomsdayer, it can't end today. you got seven more years, and then I believe there's a thousand-year millennial period, even on top of that, where Christ will rule here on earth. The King of kings, he'll be, he'll be, he'll be established here on earth. Well, look, we, I told you we could rabbit trail and get off on this. We can discuss this and debate this. This is not the point of the sermon. Uh, the sermon of Peter is not to get us to the point of actually, do you have your times right? Do you have your definitions right? What is the point of Peter to tell these people this story? Obviously, is because he's inspired by the Holy Spirit, but he's taking them somewhere. He doesn't want to get juggernauted all up in to- right in the middle of the, the discussion of end times. He wants to say, listen, it's, this is what happened. Joel said it. He's speaking on behalf of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's inspiring him to speak. But he's also saying all these other things are happening. Do we have record that the sun was blacked out all these other things happened? We don't have record that it actually has happened yet. No, obviously Jerusalem was sacked in AD 70. We know that as from history. But he's not even talking about that. Watch. What is he trying to get us to? Peter's trying to get us to understand the Word of God to get us to the point that we actually see the death, burial, and the resurrection the resurrection of jesus christ is where the power of christ is if he died for our sins and stayed dead he's absolutely useless i could do that true could i do could i say i'll die for all of you today and everybody says okay die for us and i die for your sins but i'm a sinner man i'm a sinful man right that's a disqualification and what's going to happen come tuesday i'm still going to be dead right yeah so it's useless it's pointless you can die for me. You can stand up and say, I'll die for someone. I'll die for my wife. You're still going to be dead come a couple days. Is that true? Next week, say it with me. Dead. A month from now, dead. Next year, dead. There is no way a man or woman can actually live for you and die for you because there's only been one. It was the perfect, sinless Son of God, Jesus Christ. There's only one. There is but one way. Do you understand what it, Peter is not trying to get up, caught up in the end times. He's not even going to get in when he gets into to, uh, David's prophecies here. He's looking forward to the resurrection. I, he's beating a trail as quick as he can to tell you, listen, you guys, listen, this, these people are not drunk. They're full of the Holy Spirit. And listen, this is fulfillment of what the prophecy said, what the prophet said, Joel. He's getting to the place. Joel said this, it's happening. Then King David said this, and it's happening. Because you crucified the Messiah, you crucified the Savior. Watch what he does. He's getting them directly to the cross and then to that borrowed tomb, to the resurrection. Because what started all this? If you go to Acts chapter 1, Jesus was still with his disciples, and he says, you will be my witnesses. Where? Starting right here in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and where else? To the ends of the earth, ends of the world. The four corners, if you will, north, south, East and west, that's where you're going. But wait here till the Holy Spirit comes. Now, Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit has come. Here we go. Let's go. Let's jump back into it. Verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. How do they know? Because that's where they lived. Did these older men know that Jesus, the men that were around, did they know that Jesus was sent from God? What did they say to him before they crucified him? It's only, crucifixions only happened two months earlier, a couple months earlier. What did they say to him? 
we know who our father is. What were they saying to Jesus? You're an illegitimate son of Mary. Your daddy, you don't even know who your daddy is. We know who our father is. So we know that they knew him. How about all the hug a is that a word, that actually happened when he was born? Do we still know the story? I mean, it's been a couple thousand years, and we still tell the story every December 25th, don't we? We're still telling, where was he born, church? How do you know? You weren't there. No angels come to you and told you that. How do you know? Because you trust the Word of God for that story. Shouldn't we trust the Word of God for every other story that's in there that's a historical narrative? Everything else that is said, shouldn't we trust God for what He says? We should. We should be the people of God who stand on the Word of God and promote the Son of God to the glory of God the Father. Is that true? Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. So watch what He says. He's... um, Jesus did these things, as you also know. We talked about this morning in Sunday school, the gas explosion in 1953. Does anyone know about that, Nakin? Raise your hand if you do. Does anybody know firsthand what happened? Were, did you, were you here, Richard, were you here when it happened? Eighth grade. What happened, tell us a quick snapshot what happened in eight, and this ties into my sermon today. We just talked about it in, as history. What, what store was it? Right on Main Street, is that right? All right, so that happened in the city of Aiken. How do I know that? Because I'm reading the historical markers when we did the scavenger hunt downtown. It just says there was a gas explosion in 1953. I was like, okay, I don't know that, but I'll take it. But you get an eyewitness of actually that someone that was in eighth grade, would an eighth grader remember that? The answer is obviously yes. Richard just said he did, right? So it has to happen in a small town when things happen, especially large things, everybody talks about it. And then you actually, you'll memorialize it or you'll make a history lesson out of it. You'll do something. And why do we do that? So it never happens again. All right? I asked a dumb question this morning, did the man die? Now, obviously, the gas explosion, I guess the answer is absolutely. We talked about the train wreck in Graniteville. Van brought that up. Do you all remember that if you're from the area? Even if, I w- if you're from outside the area, you know about that because it happened in a small town. What did we do down there in Graniteville? If you ride down there now, what happens? There's a couple monuments that tell you what, what happened. And for some reason, there's a Canadian flag. If you know that, tell me why after church there's a Canadian flag. I don't know. Don't tell me now. I've got to finish the sermon. But in a small town, when something big happens, everybody knows about it. And they usually tell their children about it and their grandchildren about it. When I was young, you pass the story on. But something this huge is being passed on because Peter says, you know, in verse 22, you know. Verse 23, him being delivered by the the determined purpose. You think those words are strong enough? The determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. You have taken by lawless hands and have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. You think it was God's plan that Jesus died on the cross? Did the stinking devil know it was God's plan? He didn't know. He, he kept to the place. He, he can't know the mind of God. Right? He knew there was prophecies, but he thought he'd killed the Son of God. He thought he'd won. When Jesus is nailed to the cross and it is finished, when he says it is finished, who wins? In our storylines, right? If you ever watch the movie or we actually go to war, the one who's still breathing without, with minimal wounds and the one who is, has mortal wounds, who wins? The minimal wo- wounds, right? Mortal wounds die, story's over. But this was the plan of God. The Bible, even in other places, said this is known before the foundations of the earth or the world. This happened. This was part of God's foreknowledge. God had a plan that his very son would die on a cross for our sins that we might be saved. But somebody had to nail him there. Who put Jesus on the cross? That's always an argument. The answer is, did the Jews, are they responsible? Absolutely. Romans, Absolutely. How about you and I? Absolutely, because our sins is what nailed him to the cross, and his love is what kept him there. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand, and I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Hades, or the place of death, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make 
me full of joy in your presence. That's from Psalm 16, 8 to 11. What David was talking, and Peter's going to explain that in just a moment, but he's come to the place in a Jewish custom. How many days did you have to be in the grave before you saw corruption? My class knows. Before you saw corruption, you had to be in the grave four days. How long was Lazarus in the grave? I used to read it in the King James and make it fun when I was a kid. I used to make fun a little bit because I was not a Christian kid. And I would say, Mary and Martha, they were told, roll back the stone for Lazarus. And I'd like to read the part, but Lord, he's stinking. That was just fun for me to say those words, right? How long had, you, how long had Lazarus been in the grave? Four days. He was corrupted. He was dead dead. He was dead dog dead. That's how we used to say it when we were kids. Right? Roadkill dead. He was dead. But how many days did Jesus spend in the grave? On the third day, he rose again. Why? Because the Bible uh, was prophesied that he would never see corruption. So he could not. There was no possible way for him to be in the grave on the fourth day. He couldn't take extra time. And he went down to, I used to hear when I was a kid, that Jesus went down to hell, and he, he preached in hell. Well, the place is the place of the dead. When you used to die, if you see these two tables, the best way I can explain it, when you died as in the Old Testament, before Christ, you died and you went, the unrighteous people, the people who said, I want nothing to do with God, you know those people exist? You know one of those people are standing before you right now when I was a lost knucklehead sinner, sailor? Nothing to do with God. But when those people die away from Christ, they go to the place of the unrighteous dead, a place of torment, a horrible place, but yet a place that's set aside for those people. In between that place was a place called a deep gulf. Jesus told the story of the rich man who went to Hades, Sheol, the place of the dead. And there was a man named Lazarus, a different Lazarus than I just mentioned, not the one Jesus raised from the dead. Another Lazarus, a poor man, a beggar who sat at the rich man's door begging for food every time he would pass by. And both of the men died, Jesus says, and the rich man looks over this great gulf and speaks to Abraham and Lazarus and says, listen, says this, let Lazarus just touch water and touch my tongue. I'm in torment in this place. Then he asks another question because that's not answered. It's not given permission. Let Lazarus go back from the dead and tell my brothers not to come to this place. Read the story for yourself. Don't come back to this place. He became an evangelist, didn't he? He wanted his brothers to know about how God is faithful and God is love because he's there without God. Without, he knows the truth now. Life is over. He knows he's locked in forever. Please send Lazarus back. Tell my brothers, don't come to this place. Hey, if you're lost today, can you hear that message? Don't come to this place. And the response was, if they don't hear Moses and the prophets and the law, they won't even believe if somebody comes back from the dead. You know why somebody won't believe? Because they have a hard heart. They like their self and their pride and all the things of them themselves. So when Jesus came, he came to the righteous side of death, the, the very place. And he said, I'll put it in my vernacular, hey, fellas, ladies, I am who I said was coming. You understand? He preached to them all the things, all the ones in Hebrews that got sawn in half, the ones that were eaten by a wild beast, all the ones who actually died for their faith, looking for the day, Hebrews says, that Jesus Christ would come. Hebrews 11, if you want to read for them, those people. They, he preached, listen, you did not die in vain. I am the reason. I am the one who's going to save you. And he gathers them and takes them to the presence of God. This place is shut down for business. It doesn't exist anymore. Understand? This is now in the presence of God. So when someone, Paul says to be absent from the body, it's to be where? Present with the Lord. This place is still open for business. Every lost man, boy, and girl who dies without Christ goes here to the place of torment. They're going here and filling this place. And what's going to happen is, when I said earlier, everyone gets to God at the great white throne judgment. One by one, they'll be brought out of torment, stand before God, and they're going to make their excuse. But Lord, look at Matthew 7 if you want to read it for yourself. Lord, we did all these things in your name, did all this religious stuff in your name, and he says, depart from me, I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. And he's going to cast them into what we understand as hell proper, the lake of fire. He's going to throw them forever into the lake of, of fire. Fire never goes out. It's pitch black. You'll never see another person. There are no parties in hell. There's no, it can't be. I mean, if you think about foolish, you ever hear people say, well, I'm going to go party with my friends in hell. You ever heard that some dumb person say that? Well, if there's fire that never goes out, what happens to liquid when you're in hell? 
so it doesn't exist. Anything made of any substance, what happens when the fire is so hot, it, it just permeates and burns through that. Is that true? Any drugs you want to do in hell, what's going to happen if they, if they could even get in illegally? They're gone before they even get a chance to get in. They're not there. There is no party in hell. It's only torment. It's never-ending torment in hell. We should not even want our enemies to go to that place. But brothers and sisters, listen, we're not praying like we should. We're not doing what we should to keep our family members, let alone our enemies, out of that place. Let me go through and show you a couple things from the Scripture. Verses 14 through 21. The Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit boldness, if you take notes, will cause the believer to defend the truth of Scriptures. You'll stand up and say, listen, I don't understand everything in here because please don't get caught in a trap. Because we say, do you believe this word? And we say, yes. And then we say, have you read this word? And the answer is, for most people, no. Have you read it from cover to cover? From Genesis to Revelation? Have you read it with understanding? You must come to a place that you actually, you love the word of God. 40 days in the word, I hope that's helping a lot of you. It's helping me, obviously, the refreshers to take you back to actually being in the study. But if, it's, if it doesn't matter to you, it won't matter to you. You'll actually put it aside. Holy Spirit boldness will cause the believer to defend the truth of Scripture. And I want you to see here, look, verses 14 through 21, Peter preached with raised voice the truths of past prophecy. He preached, he took Old Testament, and by the way, he wasn't carrying a load of scrolls like this going, okay, what one should I preach today? And he pulled it out, opened the scroll, and read the manuscript. That's not what he did. Where did this word come from? The Holy Spirit of God that I believe Peter had already read and memorized when he was a kid, when he came through his Jewish schooling, whatever he hid, there's that word, it's part of our 40 days, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against thee or sin against God. Are we doing that today? Peter preached with raised voice the truths of past prophecy, and Peter also preached the truths of present realities of Jesus, did he not? This same Jesus who you crucified, you're responsible for him. And he goes on and preaches the rest concerning the resurrection. Men and brethren, verse 29, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he was both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us this day. Therefore, being a prophet, did you know David was a prophet? He was a king, a priest, he was a shepherd boy, but he also was a prophet, according to Peter. And knowing that God has sworn with an oath, God made a promise to him that the that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades or the place of the dead, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. They had full experiences. God appealed to the senses, but also that other sense, that supernatural sense. He gave these men, these fishermen, these businessmen, these other people, these common people, something they never had before, and it's the power of the Holy Spirit. We have to have the power of God to do the work of God. Is that true? And the good news for us today is that, listen, if you're a born-again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says the Holy Spirit has come to live in you and around you. So when you go somewhere, listen, when you go on mission or when you're just going to the next door or when you go to work, should you go in the power of Christ? Now, I'm not talking about like a banny rooster with his chest popped out, right? Y'all know what a banny rooster is? A little small rooster looks like a game rooster. He'll, he'll crow, a little crow, but he'll, get on the, he'll come out on the he'll come out on the the chicken yard, he'll, he'll stick his chest out and he'll crow. Rrr, 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 rrr. And he'll even go up to the big roosters and he'll go stand up against them, but he will quickly lose his life. The game roosters will stick their spurs right in his neck. Have you ever seen it? And you've got to keep the bandies because they think they're hot shots. You've got to keep them away from the games because the games are hot shots, right? The game cocks, sorry, can't throw that one in there, right? They're actually, they are very much a powerful rooster. The little bitty banny does not compare, the little banny compared to the game. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Have you ever seen a, a rooster fight? Cock fight is pretty, it's pretty intense. It's pretty cool. Um, we did, we raised on the farms. We didn't ever, there's no betting for this. It just happened naturally because there's a bunch of roosters on the farm. If you see it, you go, good grief, that's crazy how it happens. But this is what's happened here. When we were Christians, we don't walk around like a bandy rooster crowing, sticking our chest and saying, I'm a Christian. Yes, I am. Right? I got spirit. Yes, I do. How I got spirit? How about you? Right? It's not a camp cheer. There's time for that, I guess, at camp for Christians. This is us walking around in the confidence of God, 
knowing that he's with me. And when he says speak, I speak. When he says be quiet, I'm quiet. When he says listen, I listen. How many of us describes us there? Sometimes we speak more than we listen. Is that true? Well, we come to the place and watch what he says. He's going to speak to these people. Verses 23 to 24. Peter preached the truths of present realities of Christ, Jesus. And then the Holy Spirit boldness, number two, will cause the believer to demonstrate the eternal truths of Scripture. He's going to force you to do the same thing. And force is a loving force. He's going to push you. Because most of you, if I say, hey, would you teach Sunday school next week? And you go, Pastor, I, I, I just can't teach. If someone gives you the lesson and you have a Bible and you pray about it, does the same Holy Spirit, and I'm not saying you're a teacher, but you should be able to teach. Is that true? Can y'all sing this song? Zacchaeus was a... Okay, that's terrible. Kids, can y'all sing with me? Sing with me, kids. Stand up, kids, and sing with me. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. Keep going. All right, stop right there. What happens is we all can be disciple makers of Christ. Is that true? How do children know how to lead out in that song when adults don't? I don't want nobody to hear me. I can't sing very good. I just, look, we're in the house of God, safest place on earth to tell God how good he is. Amen? Hey, it's, it's, it's a place for us to shout and would raise voice to tell God, you're good. And if you don't like my singing, here's the deal, sing louder. Or put your finger in your ear like this, right? Because me and Mike were singing together. We need to sing a duet. Me, me and Mr. Mike need to sing a duet, I think. Maybe we'll pull Derek into this one. I don't know if you can sing or not, but I'm going to hear it. Listen, I can't sing with a lick, but I love making a joyful noise to the Lord. And for us as the Christians, the redeemed people of God, we should come to that place when he gets a hold of us that we do what he says to do. Most of us just say, I don't want to say a word because I might lose my job. I might offend someone. And the older folks in your family, in your house, listen, did you hear it as a kid? Two things you don't talk about at Christmas and Easter and, uh, and Thanksgiving. What is it? Politics and religion. Should we be talking about politics and religion? Yes, who ordained the government? God did. Does he put people that he wants in office? We should be praying for those people. God, at the next election, would you put the man, woman, whoever it is that you got for us, would you put them in the office? Should we be praying that way? Yes, are we praying that way? Don't answer the question because I don't want you to lie in church if you haven't done it. But we should be praying that way. We should say, God, what do you desire? God, my heart has to be after your heart. And the only way we're going to know the heart of God is to know the word of God. Amen? We've got to demonstrate the eternal truths of Scripture just like Peter did. Peter quoted Old Testament truths. He went from Joel, he went back to the Psalms, and he quotes the Psalms again. Peter promoted the New Testament promises because that prophecy was a promise to you and me. Is that true? Was it a promise of his coming? I'll give you the hint. Here's the cliff notes. Was it a promise of his coming? Yes. The Messiah was coming. And you and I live in the best time ever on, on the planet Earth, I think, because we can know him personally. We can read his books. Listen, he's given us a library saying, take it home with you and read it. Read as much as you want to. And every time you read it, I'm going to bless you more and more. Every time that you look into his word, I'm going to bless you more and more. We serve an awesome God who says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. That should make you shout and get excited, shouldn't it? Might even pull a little Pentecostal in the church if you got a hold of it because the problem is many of us have been born again, but we've never experienced obviously the feeling of the Holy Spirit to the point of overflow. that It makes us get up and say amen, hallelujah, praise God. I'm a blood bolt, saint of the living God. Something you can light your fire. Paul told Timothy, fan the flame that's within you. For goodness sake, fan the flame that's within you. Is that true? Well, how do you fan the flame? The Holy Spirit's already there. You don't get any more of the Holy Spirit. It's like a gas station where your pump's on empty. But what is the feeling of the Holy Spirit? Because you get all of him when you get saved. It's not giving more of him to you. It's giving more of you to him. Do you see the picture? Peter was fully involved, if you would, like you go to firehouse sub, right? You want it fully involved, that means you want everything on it, right? Well, Peter was fully involved with God. The, the fire of God had fallen from his head to toe and he stands up and he preaches with raised voice that day and telling people listen he's going to get to the point that you must be born again he's saying the same thing about Jesus he's going to watch let's get to the point really quick verse let me jump to verse 36 therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has raised this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Christ 
Now, when these people, these are the people who are devout Jews. These are people who are doubters in the crowd. They'd come to the place. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. We call this conviction. They were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what must we do or what shall we do? And then Peter said to them, verse 38, Repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, that's me and you, by the way, as many as the Lord our God will call. And then Romans 10, 13, if you keep going even here, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be, what does the Bible say? Saved. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Amen. We've come to this place now. We're here at a turning point in our life. What do we do with the Scripture? Are we embarrassed about the Scripture? Are we embarrassed that we preach about a prophet, about the Messiah who lived 2,000 years ago? He died. Have you ever met Jesus face to face physically? No. Have you ever come to the place that God has spoken to you audibly? Don't answer that. If you have, you're probably as bad pizza. All right. How does God speak? We have to take the Scripture and see how He speaks. He speaks through his word today. The first group of apostles, how did they get the Holy Spirit? It just came upon them, right? God said, go wait. They were obedient, and here he comes. Listen, the Holy Spirit comes upon them, and they receive the Holy Spirit. But how did these people receive the Holy Spirit? They don't get it the same way that the first bunch got it. How did they get the Holy Spirit to get him the first same way? They get the Holy Spirit by hearing. Romans 10, 17 says this. Faith, they had got their faith by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Peter preached the Word of God. What must I do to be saved? Me and brothers, what should we do? And he says, repent. Well, what's this repentance about? I was always told as a kid, repentance is just turning away from your sin and turning to God. That's only half true. Repentance is this. You think about God in a certain way. You ask your friends, neighbors, just ask anybody on the street, what do you think about God? And they will have an opinion. Is that true? They'll either say, I don't believe in God, or they'll say, that, well, my God is a God of love, and my God would never send anyone to hell. Is that the God of the Bible? No. Is God the God of love? Yes. Did God create hell? The Bible says he created hell for the devil and his angels, not for you and me. So when someone makes up a God, listen, you can't control the attributes of their God. Start with, who is your God? What do you believe about God? If it's not the God of the Bible, then listen, it's a false God. Is that true? So come to this place where we actually receive the Lord Jesus Christ. We preach the same thing that Peter preaches, that people must repent. They must change their thinking about God because they have a wrong thought of God, and they must turn from their sins. It's a two-part turn because they were devout men. They, They have come to worship God with their sacrifice. They'd come to celebrate, and now they're saying, wait a minute, Jesus died. He was your sacrifice. He is your celebration. Change your thinking about God. Change, listen, take your thoughts from just God the Father, now change them to the Son. Don't leave out God the Father, but you change them to the Son because He has died in their place. He died on the cross. You know about Him dying on the cross. You knew that He was the Son of God because if you read John 3, Nicodemus said, we know that you're from God from all the things that you do. And Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. This place, Peter told him to repent. Change your thinking about God. He's not just a, you can't do enough now to satisfy God. You can't bring any more goats and bulls. You must come now and bring yourself because he's the sacrificial lamb. He died for my sins. He died for your sins. You must now come, not give your animals to God, but you must give yourself fully to God. You see the difference? Peter was preaching Jesus. You must be born again. Repent. Change your thinking about God. Change your thinking about your sin and fully surrender. Don't care who sees it. Don't care who, who, who knows. I am a born-again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. we got to quickly meet a path to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It matters. Finally, the Holy Spirit boldness sets the sinner free. Is that true? Does Holy Spirit boldness, when you preach or share it, does it set the sinner free? Well, doggone, church, I'm a sinner and I was set free. Were you not set free by the Holy Spirit of God? Then let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Does the Holy Spirit boldness set you free? Yes, if you've been born again, you are free and free indeed. Listen, you've come to the place that the truth has set you free. That's today's sermon today when you look at it. Peter preached Jesus. What must we preach today? 
Jesus. And the Holy Spirit brought about conviction to the sinner's heart. Is that true? Watch what happens. Let's finish it out here. He says, repent, verse 38, Then Peter said to them, repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises to you and to your children and to all who are far off, and as many as our Lord our God will call. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly, gladly received the word were baptized. At that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Do you think the Holy Spirit did a work that day? He did. Is he still working today? Everyone who will repent, who turn their hearts away from the, the world and away from sin and, and, and their thoughts of God to Jesus and say, Jesus, listen, here I am. As good or bad or different do you think you are, you're a sinner. And he said he came to save sinners from their sins. Amen? He died for you and he died for me. So the question is, do we believe him? Will we accept that free gift of salvation? And if we have already accepted that, will we be baptized to show and demonstrate to everyone, hey, we've been saved? And if we're baptized, will we go and, and spread the gospel like Peter did, no matter who's looking, no matter who's listening, no matter what men may say, we preach Jesus. Him died on the cross, buried, and rose again the third day. We don't quit preaching that. How many times have you ever heard me preach that? Every Sunday, right? If it's a historical narrative from Genesis, we beat a path to the cross. Is that true? The resurrection. If we're telling and reading poetry from Psalms, we beat a path to the cross and the resurrection. Every time we preach anything in this church, anything we should teach, it always ends to the point of the resurrection, that we're here today, we preach today, we gather today under the banner of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other name under heaven by which men must be saved, says the Lord. Either we believe him, or we don't. Either we care or we don't. Either we love or we don't. There is no in between. And when you say, you don't understand, I've told you before, you're right, I do not and cannot understand your situation. But God does. And I'm telling you, He's greater than your situation. What problem's too big for God, church? What problem's too small for God, church? Then what does He called you to do is go do, face the big things in life, Go face those things that we deem big. Go face those things we deem small and do it for the glory of God in the name of Jesus Christ. We must go forward in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Father God, I do pray today that we've all come to the place in our life that we've, we've struggled with ups and downs and hurts and hang-ups. And Father, it's going to keep happening as long as we live in this life. Today, Father, if there's been somebody who knows that they haven't given their heart and life to Jesus Christ, I pray today would be the day that they would actually do that very thing. And Father, there's boys and girls who, as they're coming of age, of understanding, hey, I, I need to give my heart to Jesus Christ as well. But not just my heart. I need to give all my sin, all my ugliness, everything. I want God to take it all away and have Christ live in me. Father, we, don't never, know, we never know humanly when that happens except that when it happens. We don't pick an age. We don't pick a time. We know the Holy Spirit, you work in people's lives in different ways. If someone's here today and they've never given their heart and life to Jesus Christ, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. They would say yes to Jesus. If somebody's here today and they're a Christian, but they, they've accepted Christ, but they've never been baptized, Father, I pray today they would say yes to Jesus. And Father, if there's somebody here today, they're a Christian, they've been baptized, but they haven't been faithful in your word, they haven't been faithful in sharing the gospel of the good news with their family and friends in the world, I pray today they would say yes to Jesus. Father, help us to pray for our friends. Help us to pray for our family members. Help us to be the men and women of God that you want us to be. Help us say yes to Jesus. I pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.